If you have your Bibles this morning, find, if you would, please, the 24th chapter of the book of Acts. The 24th chapter of the book of Acts will be our text today. Um, going away again another Sunday from the book of Matthew. We will re re um, rejoin that series as we move into the new year. But I wanted to preach a message today that God has burdened my heart with, and I know that I have His direction and His permission to preach the message. The text of our message today is Acts chapter 24, verses 22 to 27. I need to give you the setting of the text in order for you to get the seriousness of the message. Acts 24, our text, falls at a time in the Apostle Paul's life when he has come to Jerusalem. Um, this time in his life, as he is coming to Jerusalem, he is coming a different and changed man than he was when he left Jerusalem. The difference in the change upon his life is because he has met the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that when I met the Lord Jesus as my Savior, he changed my life. And that's what Christ does. He makes us a new man. The Apostle Paul was known as Saul back in those days. Saul was a religious man. He was a devoutly religious man, but he was also a lost man. He was a man that was, like many today, frustrated by the drive of religion, frustrated by the feeling of trying to prove himself to God or earn God's favor or God's merit. And to be honest with you, by his own words, he hated Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said later after he was saved that if God could save him who was the chiefest of sinners, then there's not a man or a woman upon the earth that God cannot save. This time, the Apostle Paul has come back to Jerusalem. And if you would look at verse number 17 in Acts chapter 24, he has come with a purpose. And the purpose says, now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. The Apostle Paul was coming back to Jerusalem to present to the church at Jerusalem a love offering. He carried a deep wound and a burden in his heart for these people because these were the people that he unleashed the fury of hell itself. These were the people that he had imprisoned. These were the people that the Bible says he committed men and women hailing them to prison. These were the people that he could not stand. And so the Bible even uses the word he wreaked havoc upon the church before he met Christ. Then when he met Christ on the Damascus road, God put within his heart a burden and a love for God's people. And by the way, that's one of the evidences that you know you're saved. You loved, you love God's people. And um, so he knew that he had stolen everything they had. They'd raped and pillaged and pilfered everything that the church had. And so he wanted to give back. So he enlisted the help of the Gentile churches. He took a love offering. You might remember that in the book of Galatians. You would remember that in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And now he's presenting this offering to the nation. When he shows up at chapter 21, verse number 17, it says, and, when, and it's important that you get the context of this. Chapter 21, verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. All right. So the brethren did receive them gladly. These were the saved people. It's not long that the Apostle Paul begins to make his way in Jerusalem into the synagogue and into the purification of the temple. You find that in verses 24, 25 at verse number of chapter 21. In, ver in chapter 21, verse 28, an attack comes against the Apostle Paul. 
And it says that while he was there, the men of crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man. Here's the declaration that the Pharisees made against him. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place being the temple of God and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted the holy place. They, the, the religious leadership of the nation, they hated the Apostle Paul. They loved him while he was Saul. They hated him after Christ. You may have had that experience. You may have been loved by some people, but then you got saved. And now because of what Christ has done in you, the people no longer look at you the same way. The Apostle Paul had that understanding. Um, and they wanted to get rid of him. Matter of the fact, when you read um, verse number 30, they had created such a stir against him that it says that all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple. Forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, so they, they were going to kill him because of who he was and what he stood for. So the Apostle Paul comes to Jerusalem. He comes to present an offering to these churches. When he gets there, the religious leadership of the nation of Israel that hated him and hated who he loved, the Lord Jesus, they're trying to destroy his life. He's rescued here um, by the Roman soldiers that are involved in that. You ought to read, this begins to unfold like a drama you would see on television. Chapter 22, verse number one, um, there's such an uproar that the Roman leadership is afraid that the city is going to be torn apart, that they do allow Paul to speak. And Paul wants to quiet, kind of quiet the crowd a little bit. Verse number 40 of chapter 21 says that he spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue. He settled everybody. Verse number one of chapter 22, he said, my brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I now make unto you. And he goes on and talks about how he used to be like them. He gives his testimony. Hey, in verse number three, I was verily a man, which am a Jew. He gives his heritage. I taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. They're going to kill him and they're thinking they're serving God by killing him. And Paul says, I used to kill people that, were, that loved Jesus thinking I was serving God. Verse number four says, I persecuted this way, the same way you're doing unto me, unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. And also, as also the high priest does bear me witness. Paul says, you can ask anybody about my old life. They'll tell you what I did. And then he goes on in verse number six and begins to give his salvation testimony. He tells about how he met the Lord Jesus. He talks about what the Lord Jesus had done for him. Um, when he gets done with verse number 20 in verse number 22, here's the response to his testimony. They gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And listen to what the, his testimony, the effect it had on them. Verse 23. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes, they went nuts and threw dust in the air. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging. So the Roman leadership, they're looking at this and they, they, they can't even understand what is going on. And so they think, well, Paul, you must be some kind of criminal and have done something wrong because of this behavior. So we're going to beat the truth out of you. And so they begin to scourge him. Paul makes in verses 25 to 30 a plea and lets the Roman soldier that's beating him know that you're beating a Roman citizen. That was a tremendous no-no. Uh, there was the law of the Romans and there was a innocence until proven guilty. This man had transgressed and he was afraid of that. He goes on in chapter 23. Paul's brought before a council here and Paul once again has the opportunity to give his testimony and he gives his declares his innocency in, in front of the Roman leadership. When you come to chapter number 24, verse number one, they have transferred the apostle Paul. 
because there was a, a, a coup out for his life. Forty men said that they were going to kill him. They wouldn't even eat until they killed Paul. Um, Paul's nephew overheard this plot. And Paul's nephew comes to Paul and tells him, I just heard that 40 men took an oath and said, they're not going to eat until they kill you. Paul said, would you please go tell the captain of the guard? The young man goes and tells the captain of the guard. The captain of the guard marshals this massive army. He was not going to let 40 Jewish men steal from him his dignity. Then they transfer, they do a prisoner transfer, and they move him to a, another place. That all takes place at the end of chapter 23. Verse number one of chapter 24, the Jews that want to kill him, they show up five days later to the other place. They are persistent in what they are going to do. This time, the Apostle Paul finds himself in front of the most noble Felix. You find him in verse number three of chapter number 24. And he is able now in front of Felix and in front of Ananias, the high priest of, of Israel there in chapter one or chapter or verse number one of chapter 24. He's got these two men. And once again, he's able to defend himself. Charges are made. Look, if you would, at chapter 24, verse number 10. Then Paul, after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered. And he goes on and he defends himself all the way down into verse number 21. Then you come to verse number 22. And we have our text today. The Bible says, And when Felix heard these things, heard the Apostle Paul's testimony, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he understood a little bit about Christianity. He deferred them and said, when Lysus, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. Lysus was the man that transferred Paul and he was waiting for him to come so he could hear about the blow up. Verse 23. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or to come unto him. So Felix shows Paul some kindness. He sends the Jewish leadership away and he's going to wait until the other Roman leader comes and he can give a testimony of what is going on. Verses 24 to 27 deal with what happens here with Apostle Paul and Felix. Pick up if you would at verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Verse 25, and as he, that's Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix did what class? He trembled. And answered, go thy way for this time. And I have this next phrase underlined in my Bible, and I would encourage you to do it as well. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Look this way. I want to preach a message to you today entitled, I will, I promise. I will, I promise. Maybe you have had that phrase said to you before, especially if you are a parent. Oh, daddy, I will. I promise. Maybe you are married. And so, wife, you have heard from the husband. Oh, I will. I promise. I will. I promise. Rolls off the human tongue just like it is gospel. Rolls off the human tongue as if we would definitely have the best intention and that it will be satisfied and it will be there and it will be no problem. I will, I promise. I have found that most of the time when we make that promise, we do not carry forward on that promise. And so I want to speak to you today from the bottom of my heart. It's the last Sunday of the year. I'm after the person today who has said, I will, I promise to God, but you have not done it. You know, I have found that time 
flies by. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. I cannot believe that Christmas has come and Christmas is gone. We have some Christmas traditions that we do and we did them Christmas Eve and it felt like we had just done them just a few days ago. Um, and, and, and how quickly time passes on. Um, and I, I don't want you to end the year with an I will, I promise mentality and you haven't carried through with it all, up with the Lord. So I'm after the unsaved person today, but I'm also after the Christian today. Um, Felix is like many people in our world today. He was familiar with Jesus Christ. He was familiar with the Bible said that way. He was familiar with the gospel. He had some kind of foundation. I don't know if he got that foundation as a child, if he got that foundation through friendship, if he got that foundation through his own study. But somehow he was familiar with this new way that was taking over the world. These people that called Christians, these people that first came out of Antioch and these Christ followers. He had some kind of foundation. And so when the Apostle Paul showed up, who was deemed to be a leader of this new way, Felix wanted to hear him. Felix went and got his wife and Felix went and got the Apostle Paul and they sat down and they said, we would like for you to preach unto us Jesus. Pretty good. And so the Apostle Paul began to preach a message. I have found that most people want to hear about Jesus until the word is preached to them. And so the Apostle Paul in verse number 25, the Bible says he had three points to his message. These three points are vital for your understanding because the power of this message and the poignancy of these points brought this powerful man to the point where he trembled in his own person. Paul chose three points. You find them in verse 25. He says that he preached on righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. All of these on in verse 24 were concerning the faith in Christ. And so the apostle Paul was very familiar with righteousness. He had lived a life trying to attain righteousness through his good deeds or through his works or through his own belief system. But it was not until he found the Lord Jesus that he found righteousness. My dear friend, righteousness is only found in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul was preaching to Felix and his wife about their need for righteousness. The Bible says there is none righteous on the earth. No, not one. There's none that doeth good. All men are sinners. And he was preaching that truth to them. And, and they were grasping that and they were understanding that. And then, the Lord Je and then the Apostle Paul preached about how God sent his son and how the Lord Jesus was the God man and how that he is the righteousness of God and how that, that righteousness was available and through believing upon on them. And here is Felix. And by the way, the Bible refers to him as the most noble Felix. And so God's preacher was looking at the most noble Felix and declaring unto him, you're unrighteous. I hope that doesn't offend you today for the Bible to declare you unrighteous. The Bible declares the whole world to be unrighteous and they needed righteousness. He moved to his second point which was a powerful point, And that was a point on the word temperance. Have you heard that word before, temperance? If you have, say amen. Temperance in the Bible is found in what passage? It's found as a part of the what class? Fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians chapter 5. Temperance is a word that and it's more than a word. It's an enablement. It's an action. It's a fruit that is only given to God's people. It is a wonderful way to expose a man to his need for the gospel because temperance carries with it the idea of self-control. Self-control. Listen, apart from the Lord Jesus, I did not know self-control. I, I may have been able to constrain my flesh, but I could not control my mind. 
I may have been able to constrain my eyes, but I could not control the lust of my heart. I may have been able not to do certain things, but there was a drive in the sinfulness of my humanity that I did not know control over, over my passion, over my lust, over the pride of my life, over sin. And so one of the evidences that you have truly been saved is you do, you can know self-control in the Lord. My friends, I'm not who I used to be. Thank you to the Lord Jesus. If you are, say amen. So here's noble Felix and his wife, Drusilla. And they're sitting there and they're entertaining the preacher. And the preacher is preaching to them about their need for righteousness and they're doing what most people do. I'm okay. I'm okay. I, um, I never killed anybody. I never hurt anybody. I never stole from anybody. I, I, I've, I've been a decent moral human being. I love my country, my family, my wife. I've, I've tried to provide the best I can. I'm okay. I'm sure they were thinking that. And then Paul broke out temperance. And what you need to know about Felix and Jerusalem, Drusilla is that they had a torrid, immoral, sexual relationship. Drusilla was married twice Felix, she left, if you study in your historians, he, Drusilla left her husband and had this relationship with Felix and she came and she married him. And when you look at their past, they knew that even though they sat there in their nobleness, the activity that was behind the scenes, they knew they had no self-control over their passion. And here stands that preacher and he begins to jab them about their inability to control their passion. And it began to control convict them. By the way, that's what the word of God does. It convicts us. And God knows exactly how to expose humanity to its lost condition. We may declare ourselves to be righteous in our mind, but when we look at this Bible, we find out that we're guilty and we're sinners. And when the preacher preaches the Bible and shows us these truths, it illumines who we are. And, and we don't really like it, but this is Paul coming after them in this temperance mentality. Now he's got their attention. Then he goes to the third point and he speaks about judgment and the judgment to come as the Bible says, for the wages of sin is what class death. That's talking about a second death. That's not talking necessarily about the first death. It's talking about an eternal separation from God. And the preacher is looking at the most noble and he's saying, you were void of righteousness. Righteousness is available. Don't think you are righteous. You have no temperance in your life. And you better understand that judgment is coming. There is a day when you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus. There's a day that you will be separated from God forever. There, you are in trouble, most noble Felix. By the way, that judgment is coming. Praise God, I will never be judged for my sin because Jesus was judged for me and I've received him. If so, you, about you, say amen. amen. But Felix hadn't done that. So when the preacher showed him his void of righteousness, his need of righteousness, showed him that he had no self-control, which is evident that he wasn't born again, and talked to him about the judgment to come, it had such power and authority that the Bible says that Felix trembled he was moved, man. He was shook. The Spirit of God was all over him. Now, what Felix should have done in that moment was he should have received Christ as his Savior. But Felix was like many people when I preach. You know, I wish you could preach one time. Um, I wish you could stand up in front of the people and watch how people respond to the gospel. It's so fun. Sometimes I, I'm, I'm laughing on the inside when I'm preaching because all of a sudden they go from this or they, they do the icky shuffle in their pew, you know, and, or they, they kind of get down like this or something like, it's funny to watch the human, all twisted up now, they, it's funny to watch the human reaction to the gospel. Felix is shook out of his mind. And when he should have humbled himself and received the Lord Jesus, he makes a statement. Go away. When I have a convenient time, I will call for thee. It's interesting about that statement. Because 
It was so dishonest. I have found that when people usually are confronted with the gospel and they find some excuse not to receive the gospel, the excuse masks their dishonesty. There's another reason. And so Felix being an important man, it was very easy and a busy man. It was very easy for him to say, got to go. Sorry. Phone's ringing. I've got things to do. But, 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 but when I have a convenient time, I, I, I'll, I'll call back for you. I'll do it. And he makes an excuse on that. I want to say a couple of things because you might be out here and you're not a Christian. And your intent was in 2014 that you were going to be. And all of 2014, you have been looking for a convenient time to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want you to know something. That time does not exist. There is no such thing when it comes to receiving the Lord as a convenient time time. If you notice, Felix was used to getting his way. If you notice, Felix was used to being in charge because he said, when I have, I will call thee. The Bible says about God that God said, today is the day of salvation. Listen, you don't, you better not trust your time to get saved. You better trust God's time on when you get saved because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed the next day. And so Felix makes a statement here, when I have a convenient season. Here's the honesty, if you look at verse 26, it's very clear. I love the Bible because it leaves nothing to be guessed. Verse 26, he, what's the next word? Hoped. He had an agenda. He had a motive. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Now, when you take verse number 26 and you come back over here to verse number 24, please do it if you would, please. Paul sends for, or Felix sends for Paul and said, I want to hear you concerning the faith of Christ. True or false statement? False. Felix didn't want to hear about Christ. Felix wanted money. And so when the conviction of God came upon Felix, he, he didn't know how to handle it. He never expected for the tables to be turned. He, he expected, he thought Paul to be a wealthy man. He thought Paul had wealthy friends. Somebody was going to buy this man's freedom. And I'm going to keep him until I get my palms greased. I'm going to keep him until I get money. So when the money didn't come initially, he kept bringing Paul up and he kept communing with him and he kept reasoning with him. The whole time wasn't so he could hear the gospel. The whole time was so he could receive money. He had a hidden agenda. But hallelujah, praise God that God knew that agenda. And even in Felix's dishonesty, God loved Felix and God was coming at Felix with the gospel. And it touched Felix's heart. And Felix didn't know what else to do but make an excuse when I have a convenient time. Now, I, I have two messages to preach, one to you and one at 11 o'clock. So here's what I want to say. Most of the time, when God has touched your heart and he has confronted you about your sin, he's confronted you about his love, he's confronted you about salvation, that's going to force you to make a decision. And the decision is either going to be an honest one or a dishonest one. And, and you're either going to receive him 
or you're going to make some kind of excuse that helps your conscience, but it really comes from a, a secondary or a, prim a primary motive of why you wouldn't receive the Lord. Felix loved money. He loved his sin. He loved pleasure. He loved all those things. And he was not willing to sacrifice them to receive the Lord. Now here's what I'm after. Is that you? Is that you? Have you been touched by God in 2014? Pricked about your need for Him? And in your mind, you've been making some excuse about convenience or you've been making some excuse about not, not able or this or that. But really, it comes from the platform of something you're just not willing to surrender. Somebody tell me where Felix is today, probably. In hell. In hell. Last night, I had the wonderful privilege to go to the Cheesecake Factory. Do you like the Cheesecake Factory? I love the Cheesecake Factory. If you go to the Cheesecake Factory, what's my time doing? Oh, I'm doing good. If you go to the Cheesecake Factory, I suggest you get something called the hibachi steak. It's, it's some kind of steak that they cook awesome, and it's a mound of mashed potatoes, and you have asparagus that comes crusted in some kind of crust. But the sauce, I love sauce. I can't stand dry food. I dip and put sauce on everything. I suggest the hibachi steak. You will lick your plate in the middle of the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> so we were there because um, we were celebrating the birthday of Ann Neely. Ann Neely and my wife share the same birthday this week, and Ann turns 80. My wife does not turn 80. <laughs> Let's get that clear. So I, it was Brother Neely and Ann, and I was sitting by Ann, and I was watching them. And, the, and man, he's not in this service, right? Okay, that old man was kind of romantic last night. Ah, <laughs> gave me some hope when I'm 80. <laughs> Some of us young men wonder what it's like when we get older. So I was expecting that. He's got his arm around her. He's holding her hand and he was loving on her. And she was taking all the love. And all of a sudden, he turned to me and he said, Pastor, he said, can I give you some advice? And I said, yes, sir, Brother Neely. Give me any advice you want to give me. He said, would you remember? It goes fast. He said, it goes fast, son. He said, I'm 80 years old and my life has just flown by. He said, I don't feel 80 in my mind. He said, in my mind, I'm about 40. Mrs. Neely said, well, I won't tell you what she said about that, but <laughs> that was not what she wanted to hear. He said, but your lifetime goes fast. I started thinking about what James said. What is your life even but a vapor? And so here's my burden today. My burden today is for the man or woman that comes to our church. And they've been touched with the gospel. They know the truth. But, but there's a, a motive or a, a, a sin or a clutching or something that they're just not willing to yield or surrender. And they make all these excuses. And the number one excuse that justifies a man's conscience is Time. When there's a convenient time, my conscience takes that as saying, I'm not totally shutting you down and I will, I promise, it helps me get through the conviction time of the Spirit of God thinking that I will, I promise. But I went to that passage in the book of Luke when Jesus talks about the rich man and the beggar named Lazarus. And the rich man never received Christ as his savior. Lazarus was a poor beggar and Lazarus did get saved. The Bible says that the rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom or paradise. The rich man didn't go to hell because he had money. He went to hell because he didn't receive Christ. And the Bible says that the rich man could see across the great gulf and there's that old beggar that was sitting outside the gate. The Bible says full of sores and the dog would come and lick his sores. And if the rich man had a few extras, he would kind of throw them out there to Lazarus. And he sees Lazarus sitting in the bosom of Abraham and he's at peace. 
And the peace that Lazarus has is so profound because the rich man who lived his whole life in what he thought was peace, the Bible says is now being tormented in this flame. And he says, Abraham, would you send Lazarus? Let him dip his finger in water and just let it dip on my tongue just a little bit. I'm tormented in this flame. And then Abraham says something to the rich man that is fascinating. He says, sir, remember thou in thy lifetime. Remember thou in thy lifetime when you had all the opportunity in the world to humble yourself. And you kept looking for that convenient season. And now your life is gone. And now you're in hell forever. And you would to God that you had one more moment. But you wasted a lifetime. I don't want you to waste a lifetime. I want you to know life in Jesus Christ. There is no such thing as a convenient time to receive the Lord. The Bible said today. Today is the day of salvation. And then I want to close with the Christian. Christian, at any moment the Lord Jesus could come back. What are you doing with your life? Did you, did you say, I will, I promise, be in the choir and you're still not in the choir? I will, I promise, I'll serve in Sunday school. I will, I promise, I'll be in the nursery. I will, I promise, God, I'll do. I will, I promise. I will, I promise. I will, God, I promise. Are you doing what God wants you to do? Did you let the whole year go by and you never did what God wanted you to do? You're still looking for that convenient time. Listen, only the flesh looks for convenience. Our flesh is lazy. It doesn't want to do anything that's not convenient. But the Spirit of God that lives in my heart should be tied to the Spirit of God. And it wants to do at moments notice, but your flesh will crave for convenience. If you live your life looking for convenience in the flesh to obey God, that's a figment of your imagination. It does not exist. The Bible says if we're going to do it, let us do it now. So don't go into 2015 with an I will, I promise. Go into 2015 with here am I, Lord. Here am I. Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it now. I promise you what God wants you to do is for your good and his glory. And God's people said, amen. Shall we pray?